As U.S. envoy to the Middle East, George Mitchell, concluded his latest visit to the region last week, Obama's stated goal of creating a Palestinian state reiterates the United States' position, pursued by all agreements since the beginning of the U.S.-mediated peace process. A Palestinian state, situated even partially in the occupied West Bank, would depend heavily on the reality of Israeli outposts and settlements in the territory. A controversial issue U.S. President Obama touched on in his Cairo speech earlier this month. The United States does not accept the legitimacy of continued Israeli settlements. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has historically opposed the two-state solution. After Obama's Cairo speech and in spite of strong pressures from inside his right-wing coalition, he agreed to the possibility with a few strong preconditions. Though rejecting a total freeze on settlement construction, he indicated he has no plans for building new ones. The territorial question will be discussed as part of the final peace agreement. In the meantime, we have no intention of building new settlements or of expropriating additional land for existing settlements. He, however, reiterated that natural growth within settlements will continue. Daniel Kurtzer of the Washington Post writes that inserting the provision of natural growth in official documents started with the 2001 Mitchell Report and the 2003 Roadmap, reflecting recognition that the concept was being abused as a justification for expanding settlements. The Obama administration is pursuing policies that every administration since 1967 has articulated. That settlements jeopardize the possibility of achieving peace and thus settlement activity should stop. Earlier, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton made clear that unofficial communication between former U.S. presidents and Israeli prime ministers, which left room for natural growth, will not stand ground with the current president. And Daniel Levy and Amja Datala commented in the Huffington Post that the West Bank settler population has increased to almost 500,000, including East Jerusalem. The vast majority of that was under the rubric of natural growth, and there are vast expenses of land annexed to settler municipalities awaiting construction. Indeed, only in March, while still in coalition negotiations, Netanyahu agreed to the construction of a new settlement in East Jerusalem, in the West Bank. The issue of settlements was supposed to be resolved by the peace process, but settlements continue to expand regardless of either the policies of Israel or the U.S. After Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin signed the Oslo Accords in Washington in 1993, a rift in Israeli society led to unprecedented settler violence against the Palestinians and escalated to the Israeli Prime Minister's assassination. The Accords created the Palestinian Authority and divided the West Bank into three areas. Area A was to be under complete Palestinian control, Area B under Palestinian civil control but Israeli military control, and Area C making up most of the West Bank under complete Israeli control. Before, during and after the Oslo Accord signing, however, no U.S. administration was able to force any Israeli government to cease settler expansion, which currently annexes more than half of the West Bank. Even if Netanyahu's right-wing coalition agrees to a total construction freeze, more than half of the occupied West Bank would already be annexed. This reflects an overall Israeli policy, says former Jordanian ambassador to the UN, Hassan Abunima, and co-founder of the electronic intifada, Ali Abunima. Netanyahu's vision offered absolutely no advance on the 1976 Yigal Alon plan for annexation of most of the occupied West Bank or former Prime Minister Menachem Begin's Camp David autonomy proposals. The goal remains the same, to control maximum land with minimum Palestinians. The Israeli Prime Minister's preconditions made clear that his willingness to discuss a Palestinian state would also be contingent on that state being completely demilitarized. The Obama administration responded to Netanyahu's speech in a short statement on June 14th, only reiterating its stated commitment to a two-state solution. His other precondition would be for the Palestinian leadership to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Francis Boyle, who served as legal advisor to the Palestinian delegation to the peace negotiations after the first intifada, remarked that this precondition would be as if the United States demanded that Iran recognize it as a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant state as part of any peace settlement. Of course, this demand is racist. It would likely lead to the denationalization of the 1.5 million Palestinians who are already second-class citizens of Israel and set the stage for their mass deportation to the Palestinian Bantistan envisioned by Netanyahu in his speech. The forced transfer of Israeli citizens of Palestinian origin was recently brought back to light by the foreign minister, Avigdor Lieberman. 
Daniel Levy added in Haaretz that if Netanyahu really believes that in order to make peace, the Arabs and Palestinians will need to become Zionists, then there will be no peace. If reiterating this recalcitrant narrative is his way of delivering a rightist-led yet viable two-state reality, however, then things get interesting. Though never stipulating the status for its Jewish citizens only, Yasser Arafat already recognized Israel's right to exist in September 1993. Since 2005, the Hamas leadership has done so as well. During Jimmy Carter's visit to Gaza last week, Ismail Haniye, the leader of Hamas, reiterated this official position by saying, على أساس إقامة دولة فلسطينية في حدود الرابع من حزيران في العام 67 وبسيادة كاملة وبحقوق فلسطينية كاملة فنحن نرحب بذلك But establishing a Palestinian state in the West Bank along 1967 lines would be a difficult reality to actualize, says Stephen Zunz. These settlements and the swaths of territories connecting them to each other and to Israel divide the Palestinian-controlled territory into 43 non-contiguous cantons, separated by Israeli checkpoints, thereby making the creation of a viable Palestinian state virtually impossible. The result is Palestinian islands, separated by Israeli outposts and settlements, Israeli-only roads, and the separation wall and fence. Also, a World Bank report published in April showed Israeli settlers who make up roughly one-fifth of the population annexed and use up more than four times as much water in the West Bank as the Palestinian residents in the region's fifth consecutive year of drought. Strategies of resolving this situation have been tackled by many. The Israeli Minister of Defense, for example, proposed building tunnels to connect Palestinian areas, including a 30-mile tunnel between Gaza and the West Bank. But many are arguing that discourse over settlement expansion in Palestinian Bantistans distracts from the fundamental question of the settlement's legitimacy, an issue Glenn Kessler of the Washington Post addresses. In his article last week, Kessler notes a 1979 legal opinion commissioned by then U.S. President Jimmy Carter reiterates the 2004 ruling of the International Court of Justice. The opinion cited Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which states that an occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies. Israel has insisted that the Geneva Convention does not apply to settlers and broadly contests assertions of the settlers' illegality. Despite the passage of time, the legal opinion has never been revoked or revised.